Okay, so you know how like every investor is always looking for that holy grail, right? Like the thing that goes up when everything else goes down. Yeah. And Ray Dalio, he once said that the real key is having a bunch of what he called good uncorrelated return streams. So today we are going to deep dive straight into a strategy that tries to do exactly that. Right. Who wouldn't want a strategy that could make money regardless of what the market does? Exactly. And the strategy we're going to explore is a statistical arbitrage model. It's engineered specifically to try to produce what are called market neutral returns. Okay, so statistical arbitrage, that sounds pretty fancy. Yeah, it's a little bit of a mouthful. But as I understand it, the core idea is about finding those little price differences between similar investments and then betting that they correct themselves. Kind of like spotting a mispricing and then you just wait for things to get back to normal and then you profit. Yeah, and the key word there is temporary. These strategies aren't trying to predict like long-term winners or losers. They're built on this principle called mean reversion, which is just the idea that these temporary divergences in prices are eventually going to snap back to their historical or expected relationship. And that leads to some key characteristics of how these strategies operate. Like what? Well, the biggest one is market neutrality. The goal is to have like an equal balance of long and short position. So that way the overall direction of the market doesn't really have a huge impact on how the strategy performs. Okay. And then you've also got that focus on relative value. So it's not about whether a stock like goes up or down on its own. Okay. It's more about how it's priced relative to something else. So less about picking a rocket ship and more about making sure the rocket ships stay the same distance apart. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And because these price discrepancies are usually pretty small and they don't last for very long, these strategies tend to involve a ton of trades, but the trades are only held for very short periods. And underneath all of that, these models are really data-driven. Okay. They rely on sophisticated techniques like statistics and machine learning. And obviously you need very careful risk management. Right, yeah. If you're making a ton of trades all the time, you gotta stay on top of that risk. Absolutely. So where do we actually see these kinds of strategies in action? Well, you see them in lots of places. A classic example is something called pairs trading. Have you heard of that? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've heard of pairs trading. So in pairs trading, you identify two stocks that have historically moved together. And then you basically bet that if their prices diverge, that eventually they'll converge again. You're betting on that spread narrowing. You also see these statistical arbitrage strategies used for managing very large portfolios to balance risk and return. Okay. And the specific model that we're going to deep dive into today actually uses machine learning to forecast short-term returns. Okay. And it then ranks a whole universe of stocks. And then based on that ranking, it takes long and short positions. Gotcha. So it's combining a couple of these different elements into one strategy. Exactly. And that brings us to why we're all here. Right. Right. This is exciting stuff, but I want to get into the details. Yeah, we'll do it. So let's get under the hood of this machine learning statistical arbitrage model. And let's see what the results look like from back testing it and really try to understand like the theory behind it. Perfect. Because that's what's going to tell us if it can actually deliver those uncorrelated returns we were talking about. Exactly. So let's start by looking at the engine of the strategy, the mm -hmm. model itself. So this particular model, it uses machine learning to predict how stocks might perform over a very short period of time. Okay. We're talking like the next three trading days. Okay. So very short term predictions. Very short term. And it looks at all the companies in the Russell 3000 index, both now and going back in time, using a very comprehensive data set from a company called Norgate. Hmm. And this data set avoids something called survivorship bias. Now, that's an important point for anyone listening. Survivorship bias can really mess things up if you're not careful. Yeah, because if you only look at companies that still exist today, you're going to get a very optimistic view of the past. Right. 
This model uses data that accounts for companies that didn't make it. So it's a much more realistic historical picture. That's super important, getting accurate backtest results. Absolutely. So to make these predictions, the model looks at a whole bunch of different factors, right? I think they're called features in the machine learning lingo. Features, yeah. So these are like the data points that the algorithm uses to make its predictions. So what kind of stuff is it looking at? So it looks at how quickly a stock's price has been changing over different periods of time. We're talking short, medium, and long term up to a year. Gotcha. It also looks at how far the current price is from its average price over various time frames. Again, going back as far as a year. Okay. And then finally, it considers how the recent trading volume compares to the average volume over the last six months. Okay, so it's looking at momentum, looking at how far things have moved. It's looking at how much interest there is in a stock, but in a very detailed, data-driven way. Exactly. And to make sure that it can compare these different factors consistently across all the stocks it looks at. Right. All those kind of distance features, like how far the price is from a moving average. Those are all standardized as percentages. And then, importantly, both the data that the model uses and what it's trying to predict that next three-day return are converted into what are called log returns. Log returns. I got to admit, I'm a little fuzzy on log returns. So log returns are very common in finance. They're used for a lot of different mathematical reasons that kind of help with analysis and modeling. Okay. And they can be a little confusing to wrap your head around if you're not used to them. So we don't need to get into the nitty gritty of the math here. Basically, it's just a way of transforming the data that makes it easier for the model to work with. Exactly. So essentially, we're taking all of this historical data and we're feeding it into a machine learning algorithm to try to predict that three-day log return. Okay. So what kind of machine learning algorithms are we talking about here? So the task is framed as what's called a regression problem in machine learning, where the model is trying to predict a continuous value. And in this case, that value is the size of that three-day log return. So the developers of this model, they explored a whole variety of machine learning approaches from simple linear models to more advanced techniques that can learn very complex relationships in the data. And their goal was really to find the algorithm that could most accurately predict those short-term price movements. So you're throwing everything but the kitchen sink at it. Pretty much. And seeing what works. Exactly. Okay, now how does the model stay up to date, right? Good question. Because the market's always changing. It is. So it's got to be able to adapt. Absolutely. So they use a method called a sliding window. A sliding window? Yeah. Okay, tell me more. So imagine you're looking at a 10-year block of historical data. Okay, 10 years. And the model is learning from this data, right? Okay. But then as time moves forward, that 10-year window shifts ahead. Okay. And the model is retrained on the newest 10-year period. So in this case, they retrain the model every year. For example, the model that was used for trading in 2024 would have been trained on data from 2014 to 2023. Gotcha. So it's always learning from the most recent 10 years of data. Exactly. Okay. That makes sense. And that way it can adapt to changing market dynamics. Exactly. Okay. So the model's constantly learning and adjusting. But the million dollar question for our listeners, does this actually give you an edge in the market? That's the big question. So to test the model's ability to forecast returns, they did a bunch of back testing. Okay. They used the trained model to predict daily returns for every stock in the Russell 3000, going all the way back to 2010. And then they looked at what the actual returns were, and they grouped the stocks into 10 buckets called deciles, based on the model's predictions. Okay. So from the highest predicted return to the lowest. And then they calculated the average returns for each of these deciles and annualized them. So they're basically seeing if the model was actually able to pick the winners and losers. Exactly. Okay. And what did they find? So the results were pretty striking. Okay. The top 10% of stocks, the ones the model predicted would perform the best, consistently deliver the highest actual returns. Interesting. And conversely, the bottom 10%, the ones predicted to do the worst, showed the lowest, often negative returns. Okay, so there was a pretty clear separation between the top and the bottom. And that's really like the foundation of a long short strategy, right? Buy the stuff you think is going to go up and you sell the stuff you think is going to go down. Exactly. Okay, so the model seems to have some ability to predict relative performance, but how do they actually turn that into a real trading strategy? Good question. So they established a very specific set of rules for trading. They decided to allocate their capital to three separate portfolios, with each portfolio starting its three-day trading cycle on a different day. Okay. So that way they could spread out their entries and exits. 
Gotcha. So it's not like everything's going in and out at the same time. Exactly. So at the beginning of these three-day cycle, the model generates its three-day return predictions for all the Russell 3000 stocks. Okay. And based on those predictions, they would take long positions in the top 20 stocks, the ones with the highest predicted returns, and short positions in the bottom 20 stocks, the ones with the lowest predicted returns. So it's a balanced approach, aiming for that market neutrality that we talked about earlier. What about like position sizing and risk management? Good question. So they implemented a rule that no single position could be larger than 3% of their available capital. Okay, that makes sense. They also decided to exclude certain types of stocks. They excluded penny stocks, biotech stocks, and meme stocks. Meme stocks? Yeah, those can be a little wild. They can be. And the reasoning here is that those stocks tend to experience very large and unpredictable price swings. Okay. Especially overnight, which can be risky. Yeah, especially for short positions. And interestingly, their research actually indicated that meme stocks could be identified algorithmically. Wow, that's fascinating that you could actually use a model to flag those kinds of situations. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, so they put on these long and short positions, and then what? After three days, at the start of the next trading day, all the positions in that portfolio are closed out. And the process starts again with fresh predictions from the model. And they also factored in trading costs, right? They did. They estimated trading costs at 10 basis points per trade, and they factor that into their backtest results. Okay, so what did the numbers actually look like? Yeah, so the results from that initial backtest with 20 long and 20 short positions and that 3% capital limit were very impressive. The strategy produced an average annual return of 21.7%. Okay. Which is about double what the S&P 500 did over the same period. The risk-adjusted return measured by something called the Sharpe Ratio was 1.46, again, significantly higher than the benchmark. And the maximum drawdown was 21.8%, which was actually better than the benchmark's drawdown. Okay. So pretty solid performance all around. Yeah. And I think, as you mentioned earlier, the connection to the overall market was minimal. Yeah, that was one of the key things I was curious about. Yeah, so the correlation with the daily returns of the S&P 500 was just 0 0.09. Wow, that's really low. That strongly suggests that this strategy is actually generating returns that are independent of how the market's doing. Exactly. That's the holy grail. It is. Uncorrelated returns. Yeah, and on average, each trade actually generated a positive return of 0.76%, with a win rate of just under 50%, and a payoff ratio of 1.24. Which means which means that the average winning trade was more profitable than the average losing trade was costly. Gotcha. So you don't need to win every time to be profitable. Okay, so they didn't stop there though, right? They kept tweaking things. They did. In a second experiment, they reduced the number of long and short positions to 10 each. Okay. And they increased the maximum capital allocated to each position to 4%. Okay. And this actually led to even better results. Oh, wow. The annual return increased slightly to 22.7%. The Sharpe ratio improved to 1.57, and the maximum drawdown decreased even further to 16.6%. Wow. So they were able to improve the returns and reduce the risk. Exactly. The average return per trade and the win rate also saw small increases. And the correlation with the market remained very low at 0.11. Okay, so still very uncorrelated. Very uncorrelated. Okay, that's cool. It's interesting how just making a few small adjustments can really fine-tune the performance. It is. Okay, so what else did they try? So in their final experiment, they tried increasing the trading frequency. Okay, how did they do that? Instead of holding positions for three days, they shortened it to two days, which meant they had to divide the capital into two portfolios instead of three. Right, because they're always going to have some positions open. Exactly. This actually resulted in a significant jump in the average annual return up to 28.2%. Wow. With an improved risk-adjusted return of 1.72, the maximum drawdown remained low at 16.7%. So almost a 30% annual return. Almost. Yeah, and they actually looked at how this two-day holding period strategy would have performed if it had been traded since 2010. Oh, okay. And the results show that every single year would have been profitable. Wow. Every single year. Every single year. An impressive 66% of the months were positive, with the best month generating a return of over 14%. Wow. The negative months, which accounted for 34% of the total, had a worst month of negative 8.6%. Okay, so the losses were relatively contained, even in the worst month. Okay, and they also looked at the longest streaks of positive and negative performance. They did, to get an idea of 
the potential for both sustained gains and periods of losses. Right, because even the best strategies are going to have some losing streaks. Absolutely. How much of this performance is simply due to exposure to these well-known market factors? That's a great question. Right, because we want to make sure we're not just replicating something that's already out there. So how do they address that? So to address that, they use something called the Fama French three-factor model. Okay, the Fama French three-factor model. It's a pretty common way to analyze the risk and return of investment strategies. It is, and this model essentially tries to explain a strategy's excess returns based on three factors. Okay. So the overall market's performance, the difference in returns between small and large companies, and the difference in returns between value and growth stocks. Gotcha. So they're trying to see how much of the strategy's performance is due to these three factors. Right. And what did that analysis reveal? So the regression analysis showed a statistically significant and positive alpha of 0 0.0961. Okay, so what does that mean? So in this context, alpha represents the daily excess return of the strategy. That can't be explained by those three factors. So it's kind of like the strategy's unique edge. It is. The market beta was statistically significant, but quite low at 0 0.0777. Okay. Which confirms the strategy's low sensitivity to broad market movements. Right, which is exactly what we want from a market neutral approach. Exactly. And then importantly, the size beta and value beta were not statistically significant, indicating that the strategy's returns aren't being driven by a bias towards small cap or value stocks. So it's not just a disguised way of capturing existing factor premiums. Exactly. Okay, and what about the R squared? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, so the R squared was very low, 0 0.010. So what does that tell us? So that means that only about 1% of the daily excess return variation of this strategy is explained by the Fama French three-factor model. Wow, so like almost none of its performance can be attributed to those three factors. Exactly. Okay, so that really reinforces the idea that this strategy's returns are uncorrelated with these common market risks. That's pretty amazing. It is. So we've covered a lot of ground here. What are the key things we should take away from this deep dive? So I think the main takeaway is that this statistical arbitrage strategy which leverages machine learning and a market-neutral long-short approach has demonstrated really significant potential for generating returns that have a very low correlation to the S&P 500. Right, and that's all in backtesting, of course. Of course. Yeah, this is all historical data. Right. We have explored the core of the model, the evidence suggesting that it has a predictive advantage, the specific rules of the trading strategy, and the results across different scenarios. And those results were pretty robust. They were. I mean, a 28% annual return yeah. with low correlation to the market. That's pretty darn good. Yeah. And the Pharma French analysis provides further support for the idea that these returns aren't just a byproduct of exposure to common market risks. Right. It's something unique. Okay. So this is a really sophisticated way to try and achieve those sought after uncorrelated return that everyone's looking for. Yeah. And it's important to note that the developers are still exploring ways to improve this approach. Okay, like what? Well, they mentioned possibilities like refining how they weight the long and short positions, potentially earning interest on the uninvested cash, and even applying the model to a more focused set of stocks. So they're not done yet. No, they're not. There's still room for improvement. Always. That's cool. So as you've been listening to this, I want you to consider this. How might the fundamental principles at play here, like identifying relative mispricings, and constructing market neutral strategies. How might those principles inform your own understanding of market dynamics and risk management? That's a good question. Right, and I'm not saying you need to go out and implement a high frequency trading system, but thinking about the power of truly uncorrelated returns and how they can contribute to a more resilient and diversified portfolio. That's a valuable exercise for any investor because it makes you think about where true diversification really comes from beyond just holding different types of stocks and bonds. Right. All right, well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into statistical arbitrage, and we'll see you next time. See you later.